started. Um, welcome. I'm Joanne Tomshi. I am the manager of Parks Exhibition Center for the Unrelated Summer Program. Tonight's opening, I hope you'll stick around after Nathan's demo and lecture. Uh, tonight's opening featured work by our adult program workshop faculty as well as several of our family camp workshop faculty. And it's a terrific show. So, um, after Nathan completes his demo, I'm going to ask you all if you will do me a favor, pick up your chair, take them outside, that's our usual sort of drill here, and then we will reopen the gallery at 8 o'clock for the opening, but we need a few minutes to reset things, remove all kinds of things that are in the way of seeing work. So, that's that, I'll remind you at the end. Um, so, Nathan Youngblood, <coughs> our artist tonight, is a sixth generation potter, from San Antonio Pueblo in New Mexico, and is the grandson of renowned potter Margaret Tafoya, and the son of Mela Youngblood. Come on in, come on in, coffee shop. He's been making pottery since 1972, creating both black and red and tan traditional styles, and adhering to all the traditional aspects of making a bowl. Have a seat. <laughs> Nathan has won numerous awards in Native American pottery competitions. His work has been exhibited widely at galleries and museums across the country, and he has been included in numerous magazines and books on Native American art and pottery. Nathan has served on the boards for the American Craft Council, Gallup Intertribal Ceremonial, the Southwestern Association of Indian Arts, and the Mill Wright Museum. So, I'm Really excited to have Nathan here with us tonight, so let's welcome Nathan. Nathan. found in foothills around Santa Clara Pueblo, the large community pit, and there is uh, a number of smaller places where families go to acquire clay for different shapes of pots. They'll have uh, different kinds of strengths. So uh, I have one spot that I go for large pieces like storage jars and water jars, and another spot I go to for plates. And the clay may be interchangeable, but I've just found that those, that's the places I was taught by my grandmother, and those places seem to work. So a lot of what I've learned in my life, I don't question, I just do because it works. Next slide, please. This is the area where we dig the sand to temper our clay. The clay itself, when it comes out, um, is not strong enough to make pots out of, so you have to add some sort of a sand or temper to it. This is a fine white volcanic ash. Um, it's sort of a form of pumice. And it's crushed up and added to the clay after the clay is uh, cleaned up and sifted. Next slide, please. In order 
clean my clay, I break it up into little pieces and put it in a large uh, watering tank that you use for watering cows or horses and add a lot of water. And then I stir it until it's slurry. And the first process is to run it through a screen here. This is a 20, inch, a 20 squares per inch screen. It's the size of screen you would have on your windows or your doors. This gets out the larger rocks, the larger pieces of roots, anything that's undissolved. The next thing I will do is run it through another screen, and that screen is 100 squares per inch. It's known as a hardware cloth. And this gets out any of the larger things that uh, got through the first city. Usually when I run clay, I'll run uh, 500 to 700 pounds at a time. It takes me four or five days. I'll set up 20 plastic trash cans. <coughs> I'll run uh, clay into each trash can. And at the end of the day, uh, I should have 20 trash cans full of uh, a slip or a clay and water base. About the third day, I'll come back. The water has separated up to the top, the clay to the bottom. I'll start sifting all of that water on and then consolidating the clay into uh, fewer containers. By the time I'm finished over a three or four week period, the 20 containers will be down to three containers. Mm -hmm. And that'll leave me enough clay to make pots for about three years. Next slide, please. This is dipping the water off. I found that plastic bags and little trash cans leaked, so I went to the plastic containers. Next, please. This is a slide of my mother getting ready to, actually, she's preparing it. I'm going to be the one mixing the clay. Um, what we do is we put the volcanic ash in a pile and then pour, begin to pour the clay in and kind of hand turn it over. It's very similar to making uh, pasta dough only it's on a much larger scale, and you don't mix pasta dough with your feet. So Nathan gets to get in here in his bare feet, stomp around on this, and the first thing that happens is the white sand turns kind of a bluish color or a gray color, and you keep adding clay and mixing it and mixing it, and you know that the, the batch is thoroughly mixed through when you no longer see these little blue streaks of uh, sand. Next week. Now before this step, what I do now is called hand wedging. After my clay is mixed, it's set on the tarp, it's hardened up a little bit, then I run it through a vacuum pug mill. Some of you are familiar with that. A uh, pug mill is a screw type apparatus that shoots through a sleeve, uh, has some sifting or, or shredded areas in there, and it has a little box somewhere on the tube that a vacuum pump is connected to and that sucks out the air. If I just take a piece of regular clay and hand wedge it, uh, it will take me anywhere from 40 to 50 minutes. If I plug it first, it gets out about 98% of the air, and then it takes me five to seven minutes to hand wedge it. So if you can imagine the amount of time I save, um, not to mention it's easier on the hands. If you did this all day long in a 10 hour day, you couldn't lift your arms. And I've done that so long. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get the air out. The air is a killer in, in coil work. When you're building pots, if it's in the um, walls of your pot at all, when your pot's dry and you're getting ready to fire, it's not the air that expands, it's the moisture in the air in the air in the bubble in your wall of your pot. And if it rapidly expands, your pot literally blows up like a trap. And if you're firing with other people, when that happens, they don't invite you to fire with them anymore because you've damaged their pots. And uh, I was telling my class this morning, when I first started helping, when we first moved back to Santa Clara Pueblo and I was helping my grandmother fire, my aunts would all bring their pots down and grandma would have to fire like 20, 25 pieces at a time. Well, slowly everybody move towards that person can't fire because their pots blow up and that person can't fire with us because they're and eventually there's grandma firing by herself and she wouldn't fire with any anybody else because their pots kept blowing up. So what I'm doing here is I've hand winched this piece of clay for a while and then I, I have a piece of wire you can sort of see it coming down from left to right. And I use that to cut the clay open. Next slide please. And then I'll squeeze it. 
and what I'm looking for is any air bubbles. And after I do this two or three times and don't get any air bubbles, I know this piece of clay is ready to make a pot with it. Usually when I uh, cut clay, I will cut um, maybe 100 pounds at a time. That's about all I can do. And that would be about three quarters of a um, five gallon bucket of clay. Thanks, Lisa. So after I do that, two chunks of clay, I make it into a large ball. And I will put uh, these into um, plastic bread bags and store them in a, in a five gallon container with a seal on top. This particular piece we're going to start uh, making a pot out of. Next shot. Next, please. Every pot uh, that's made is started as a pinch pot. This is a large pinch pot. But whether it's a miniature or it's a large storage jar or anything in between, we start uh, pinching it out to form a shallow dish, try and get the um, walls of it even, uh, the bottom of it even. Next, please. So here I'm using a, a little clay tool and I'm working on my lap. I work on my lap primarily because uh, when I learned to make pottery, my grandmother sat in a small stool. She had a board on her lap and she worked in her lap and that's how I learned how to do it. Now it's the most comfortable way for me. So I'm taking the tool, I'm smoothing this out, I'm stretching the clay, I'm looking for air pockets. I'm supporting it on the outside, making sure it doesn't crack while it's stretched out. Next please. The dishes we use to hold our, our pots when we're building them are called cookies. This particular dish has uh, got a slick finish on it, like porcelain finish. And if I just put the clay in there, as it dries, it sticks to the surface of this dish because it's slick and it cracks it. So we use a piece of newspaper that we wet and place in there uh, to fit, to tuck the, uh, the little edges down underneath. And this acts as a wick to keep the clay from sticking to the Next, please. And I'll set that in there, and I'll begin to stretch that out to fit inside this bowl. You can see the tool on the left side, and I have little pieces of clay. Uh, I try not to throw any clay away or waste it when I'm sanding. You'll see all this stuff later on. I use a vacuum cleaner, and I save every bit of clay I can. I figured at one point that it took 30 to 40 hours to process from digging, processing, prepping, mixing everything, uh, one cubic foot of clay. So uh, every bit you save, you save hours of work. Next, please. <coughs> We've got to fit into the buki. We've stretched the inside. Now we're going to smooth and stretch out the outside. And while I'm stretching, I'm shaping. Uh, I'm also looking for air pockets. And that's just one of those constant things you always looking for an air pocket. It can be big, it can be little. When they appear, they appear as a little blister, or if they're a big air pocket, a big blister. And you take your thumb and you push into the clay and break that, and then sort of pull the clay around and fill that area up and smooth it out. Next, please. Uh, again, everything I do is made by coil, uh, whether they're the miniature pots or the larger pots. And the only thing that determines the size of the piece one, you should put but two, how many coils you put on it, how far you stretch it. So what I've done is I've taken another lump of clay and I'm rolling it out with my hands next. And then I place it on the board on my lap and I flatten it down. Uh, what I use is a modified coil slab. This allows me to raise the balls of my pots up much quicker than just doing the regular coil technique. I can also control the thickness of the coils as they go on by doing it this way. So now I'm pinching this pot on, uh, pinching this uh, clay coil on. Let me see my thumb prints. Next, please. Now uh, that first coil didn't stretch all the way around, so we're adding a second coil, overlapping on the ends. Next, please. Now once I've pinched it from the inside and pinched on the outside to bond it together, I have a tongue depressor here and I'm scraping uh, and pushing and pulling the coils together. Again, I'm stretching and I'm shaping them while I'm doing it. And looking for air problems. <laughs> I, I will keep saying that. 
because that is that's just a killer on the plot. Next one, please. <coughs> Once I'm happy with the outside being, being stretched out and uh, the, the coils are bonded together, then I go back on the inside and I'm beginning to shape the piece to try and bring the upper part of it down and around to form a bowl. Next, please. As you can see, I'm starting to bring the top of the bowl in. And as I'm doing that, I'm work right now I'm working all the way around. I'm trying to get an even level on the piece. So any excess clay, little humps I take off with my finger. Uh, you get the little thing at the top, you get rich like that. Once you've gone all the way around, you can take those off. Um, next, please. Now you get a better feel for the top coming in. When I first started making pots, the joke in the family was that Nathan sells his work by the pound because he made it so big and so heavy. And then working with my grandmother, I learned to make pieces much thinner and <coughs> probably get twice as many pots out of a batch of clay as I was uh, at the very beginning. My grandmother would look at I'd show her a piece when I get finished. I'd go, oh, what do you think of this piece? And she'd pick it up, she'd go, I could make three pots out of this. <laughs> I said, well, what about the shape stuff? And she'd say, I could make three pots out of this, because she knew how hard it was to get clay. That was more important to her than, than uh, what she did with it at the time. Next, please. Now, I haven't added another coil. This is just what we've seen put on and stretching it up and pulling it up and shaping it. What I'm using here is a old Rubbermaid spatula thing. And uh, as the final thing, besides shaping, we are looking for air pockets. <laughs> now, once this piece, I'm satisfied with the shape on this piece and the thickness and everything is just right, then I put it in the cabinet and I let it sit for about four or five days. The upper part of the rim will begin to get light colored and crust up, and that lets me know that it's firm enough for me to pull, to set it upside down, pull the pookie off. And that's what I'll do. And then I take my, my pottery tools and I smooth the bottom and I look, press it down and look for air pockets, make sure there's no cracks and no problems whatsoever. And then I'll wash the pookie, put more newspaper in, take the vessel turn it right side up, set it back in there, and then I set it into a cabinet and I don't touch it for 30 days. Don't even look at it. Don't open the door. Don't even, don't even. I can't change anything at that point. And it's, one of the first things I learned was you better have patience and it's hard to just wait things out. But uh, other things I've learned is if you start working on the pots, trying to carve them and fire them too early, they're gonna blow up. So just leave them alone. Next slide, please. This piece is completely dry. So the first step is to do a rough sanding of the outside. Next slide, please. <coughs> and the inside. You wanna, uh, when you have a, that much of an opening, you should always sand the inside, make it smooth. Next slide, please. Now, what you see here is block of stone, a bunch of poker chips, <laughs> and a pencil. <clears throat> and I'll use that first to level the piece, and then uh, once the piece is level and I'm happy with it, then I'll cut my main channels. These are the guide channels, that are the edge channels, and they'll determine the, uh, the band that the design will sit in. Next slide, please. After I've cut those channels away, you can see the depressions there. <laughs> then I start drawing uh, the rest of my design work on using a pencil. The designs are designs I've learned from my grandfather and my grandmother, and designs that I've seen in books. Um, one of my students uh, asked me about an Asian influence. Every time my wife and I travel to a major city, we go to the museums. Most museums have an Asian exhibit. 
Next, please. Now, once the design has gone on, then I take a, uh, uh, a tool and begin cutting an edge on it. Uh, this particular tool is a dowel rod with a square floor nail in it, and the end of the nail has been filed down to the angle uh, that I desire. And when I make a cut on these lines, you don't cut at a 90 degree angle, you cut at a beveled edge, and you cut into the bevel coming into your design. That keeps it from chipping. Next, please. Once all the design has been initially cut, then I go back in with this small screwdriver and I kind of wiggle and, and chisel that uh, extra material out. Next, please. And then I take a Dremel tool with a 1 8 inch tungsten bit on it and I Dremel out all of the excess material here, or most of the excess material. Next, please. After I blow all the dust off, then I'll take a small brush with a little bit of water, and I put the water in each design, and then I take uh, screwdrivers that I've filed down to the sizes that I want, and I start to scrape out that material and level the channels. Next, please. Next, please. This slide was cutting the edges, and this is uh, leveling out the channels. And I'll do this uh, all the way around until uh, the piece is completely carved. Next, please. Now, after the carving's done, then we do a, a last sanding. What I'm doing here is I've sanded the entire surface of the pot, and then I'm going over with little pieces and I'm beveling or rounding the edges of the carving so that when I burnish the piece later on, it won't chip. Next, please. Now, after I've sanded it and wiped the dust down, I'll let it sit. Usually, I try and get everything done overnight, clean up my work area, and then I'm ready to burnish the next day. Before I begin burnishing, if the piece is going to be black, then I'll take the slip I'm going to use for polishing, and you can see the color of it, and um, fill in all the carving to begin with, and let it sit for about an hour to dry. I usually fill it in twice to make sure it's smooth. It smooths down the insides of the channels. It keeps the edges uh, slightly smooth too, so they don't chip as well. Next, please. Now, the first thing we do is uh, apply a slip, and the slip is a, another natural clay that we get in the hills near us, or in some cases, we trade with other pueblos that have uh, this particular red, high, high iron oxide red clay. It's a natural clay, it's just suspended in water to form a slip. We'll paint several layers on. Next, please. Next, please. After the second layer is put on, step A. Then I brush with a stone. This particular stone here, I got from my grandmother, who said she got it from her grandmother, who told her she got it from her grandmother. And it came from another generation beyond that. So it's a, it, I'm at least the eighth generation using this particular stone. <coughs> I tell people if my house got on fire, I would rescue my family, my animals, and my stones. Everything else I could replace. But when you learn to use a polishing stone or a burnishing stone, you have to learn to match the stone. The stone has a certain way that it will work on the pots, and you have to learn to build your stroke around that, your touch around it, the feel around it, everything about it. And it took me over a year to learn how to use this particular stone. Next, please. After the first uh, initial burnishing, you can see these stone marks on it. And I put a second layer of slip. And uh, how many layers you put on depends on how thick your slip is or thin your slip is. It also depends on the humidity. And during the summer, I tend to put an extra layer of slip on because it's dry and hot. And it keeps the, that section from drying too quickly before I get the finish burnished up. Next, please. After the second layer, we burnish it one more time. Next, please. Then I put an ultra-thin layer of, of grease on. 
You can use baking grease, you can use butter, I know some people use Vaseline, just something, but it has to be a very, very ultra thin layer on it. And it keeps the clay from drying too quickly before you can get the glassy finish on it. Next please. <clears throat> So the next step can take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, depending on the humidity in the air, how large the section is, how wet you've got the, the section. But you have to burnish it until um, most of the, if not all the moisture is out of it. The first thing you'll feel is that the stone is gliding effortlessly like sliding on ice. As the piece begins to dry or the section begins to dry, you will get a section of it that dry quicker than the rest, so you'll find areas where the stone starts to drag a little bit. And then you look to see uh, what the colors look like. This is all things that you can't really teach people. You can tell them, but you have to do it yourself, and you have to do it many times to actually understand when the time is right uh, to stop burnishing. If you burnish too long, um, you go from the glassy finish to a dull finish. You actually scratch your finish away. If you don't, Go long enough, you have it dried it long enough, it will continue to dry and you get little spider web cracks all over the finish, and that's not desirable either. So you gotta get your jizz right. Next please. <coughs> After I finish burnishing every section on the piece, then I'll pop it in my oven and I slowly bring it up to 525 degrees for an hour. Or wash it at 525 degrees for an hour. And then I turn off the oven and let it cool. And usually I do this uh, at night. It's the last thing I do. Shut off the oven, go to bed, get up the next morning. Within eight hours, nine hours, the piece is cooled enough, I can pull it out. Now I'm trimming off the edges. When you burnish these designs, you build a little crust or edge around the edge of the design work. So I go back in with these sharpened uh, screwdrivers and I peel that edge off smooth it off, and then I'll go back in. You can see at the top of my fingers there, or my thumb, I'm leaving a little white edge on that. That's back to the, the base color of the clay. Next, please. And then I'll take a, a small brush and try to get all of that stuff built back in without getting it on the uh, edge of the piece. Because I preheated it, if I overlap it a little bit, but I just lightly, I can take a soft cloth and it's just sort of wipe the edge off and it'll go back to the shine and take away the mat. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, we finish up the pot, it's ready to fire. Uh, rather than a pit method, I use a above the ground or on the ground bonfire method. I'll take four tin cans. Next slide, please. And I set a milk milk crate on that. And then I'll put the pot inside. And then I put a piece of stove tin on the top. I, this is uh, for fuel under fire. I use a split cedar mm -hmm. and lighter fluid. I cheat. I'm not rubbing two sticks together. <laughs> <laughs> so this has come out of the oven, and you can see this, it's dark. Uh, this is a, uh, a carved water jar. The top is red. The center part that you can see, where the tan area is, is actually burnished tan. And I think the bottom will be red. Um, the red for the for the polychromes is a very deep blood red slip. It's very high in, in iron oxide, which is what makes it so red. The tan section is just the body of the pot that I apply water to. I don't use a slip. Burnish it the same way. Layer of water, burnish, a layer of water, burnish, and then uh, grease, and then I burnish it until it's dry. Next, please. Now as the fire starts to build up, the first thing that happens is the soot adheres to the outside of the pot. Next please. And then we'll push some more cedar on the inside and then stack some wood up on the outside. I used to use, uh, in th these particular photographs, I'm using uh, the bark that's cut at the sawmills off of the trees. It's fine for the polychrome pieces, but when you're doing the black pieces and you're going to see me put manure up, you've got to have the edges tight. So I use 2x6 construction lumber now for all of my firing, actually. 
The other advantage is you don't know how what the moisture content is at the sawmills. Uh, the industry standard is uh, seven percent or less for construction lumber, so you know it's always been kiln dry. Next, please. We're firing outside here. Now I have a big building to fire in, but I'm holding a piece of tent to keep the breeze from blowing on one side. Um, what happens is the wind catches on one side, it stokes the fire, it gets it hotter. When you're firing a polychrome piece, it can um, just color and burn out the uh, iron oxide. So the, the red goes to more of a brown, and that's not a desirable effect. Next, please. Here I'm checking to see inside uh, that the <clears throat> soot has burned off the pot and I'm looking at the inside of the carving on the polychrome. It doesn't have any slip in it. It's just a natural clay. So I'm looking to see that the soot has burned out of that. That gives me an idea that it's about ready to be pulled. Now what we're going to do on the polychromes is we pull all the fuel away. Next please. <coughs> Next please. And then I pick up the crate with heavy gloves. I take it inside, uh, in this case, into the garage. I have clean metal trash cans, and I'll put the whole thing into a metal trash can and put the lid on top. Now what this does is it superheats the air on the inside, but then it slowly dissipates the heat. So it, um, it controls its own environment as it cools down. Um, in years previous, before I used the trash cans, we pull a piece out, we set it over to the side, if the wind, a little breeze picked up, one side would cool quicker, you could hear it snap. <laughs> and that's just a horrible, sick sound. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> okay, this is what the piece looks like finished. You can see the tan, you can see the red. The band above the, the Avani or water serpent is just a natural clay and it's been soft sanded down to 220 grit. Same thing. The inside of the uh, channels, when you do the red, up at the top, your brush strokes get in there, you leave a little red residue, slip residue, that fires in. So I take the same tools that I've carved the piece with, resharpen them, and I go back in, and I clean all of those channels out. A piece like this will take about 12 hours of hands-on work to reclean. Next one. Now we're firing two black pieces here. The slip is a little different color, it's more of an orange red. And in the same process, we have a, a large crate on tin cans, cedar stuffed underneath, and we're getting the fire going. Next, please. We get the wood on the outside and wood on the top. Again, the first thing that happens is the soot adheres to the pot, and then as it slowly burns off, you can see that it's uh, like when you heat a piece of steel or iron, it gets a, sort of a gray pink. That's the color I'm looking for. Next, please. Next, please. Now, the far side has begun to get ready. It's clearing up. All sits gone. We push the boards together as best we can. And we're starting to pile, pile up shredded, dry horse manure. Next, please. <clears throat> now, the sides that have a horse manure on it are already beginning to drop in temperature. The sides that are open here are still burning high, and we're waiting for that side to clear out. Once you get uh, the sides clear and you push your boards together, um, you need to get your manure at least halfway up. That begins the cooling process. It's not going to overcook the pot. Next, please. Once everything's, tight, everything's tightened up, and I'm sure that uh, hopefully nothing's going to fall in, then we get more manure up and we bring it up, and we'll use boards and uh, little plastic containers. In this case, I think we used uh, more metal milk crates, and we'll shore everything up on the sides. Next, please. There you go. Now, my grandmother taught me that when you get to this point, don't cover the fire up. Throw a couple of pieces of wood on there and let it burn for about 10 minutes. And what that does is it helps 
burns up the oxygen on the inside. And if you underfire your pot a little bit, it still allows it to warm up a little bit more, and any film that's on there will come off uh, after the fire is done. Now this is called, the first fire we saw was called an oxidation fire. <coughs> this is called a reduction fire. Most natural clays, when they're superheated and the oxygen is cut off, will turn black. The process, while in this part of the country is or, or in New Mexico is unique to the northern pueblos. Um, the process itself, they documented back 5,000 years ago and it was done in Turkey. So it's not a new type of thing. Next, please. <coughs> the final thing is to put a piece of tin on the top and then we throw more manure on it and shut off all the air. Next, please. No. Oh. Oh. Now, not everything comes out. <laughs> the piece that uh, I'm holding there is uh, a jar my mom made, and she got it too thin. And when she carved it, she didn't realize how close she was to going all the way through. So when it was fired, the bottom literally fell off. <coughs> the pot down, down to the bottom right is a double banded water jar. And she did everything right until she got to the neck. And she didn't get the air pocket out. And it blew up. But the bottom stayed intact. So this is what happens when we don't get the air pockets out. <laughs> now I'll show you what happens when we do get everything right. Next please. This is a straight ribbed melon bowl. Uh, this is the old style of doing it, where the, the burnishing, there's no segments in between. Um, the art in doing this is to burnish it in sections and then join the sections, and that's very difficult to do. Next, please. This is not a jar for ashes. <coughs> this is just actually a, a, what we call refer to as a ginger jar. The very top of the, the lid that you can see, um, there's a hole there where you slide your finger in. And uh, somebody asked me if that was to allow the spirits to enter and leave, and I said, no, it's allowing Nathan to stick his finger in there and lift the lid up <laughs> without dropping the lid. <laughs> but if you like that story, you can. You can <laughs> <laughs> These are a pattern of wave designs, waves like you see on the water. Next, please. This is an oval box. Um, my grandmother's generation, my great grandmother's generation, did square boxes, and they would put on the very top, they would put a little animal, usually a turtle or a, uh, a bear. I'm not part of the bear group, so I don't put bears on my pots. But I can do all this other stuff. <laughs> Next, please. This is a, what I refer to as an eclipse moon plate. I'm sure I saw something in a NASA photograph and I thought that's really cool but that's it. So. <laughs> Next please. <coughs> There's three shots of this and the reason I included it is because it's a continuous design that works all the way around. Next please. Next please. Next, please. One year for Christmas, my wife gave me a book on Fabergé eggs. <laughs> <coughs> so I thought, I wonder if anybody's done that in the way. So this is where this idea came from. This is the 
this is three separate sections. And uh, the difficulty in this is that after the pieces are dry, they have to be fitted. And all three pieces have to be fitted before anything else is done. So when you fire them, they're fired separately. And if one piece cracks, blows up, breaks, whatever, you have, it's not easy to make a replacement section for it. So, fortunately, I only have a couple of pieces in my personal collection of incomplete eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever got, I, I would have the privilege of going to a Dale Chirpy um, exhibition in um, Cincinnati. No, Charles. Charles. And um, there's a long hallway in the upper part was clear glass and he had all these great little pieces. And I'm walking with all these guys who make glass. And I said, this is really cool. And I said, geez, these are all the pieces that are left over from his projects, you know. <laughs> who else could figure out a way to turn this into an incredible exhibition with all the extra stuff that's left over? So that's, that's never going to happen with me. <laughs> Next, please. Plates are a very difficult shape to do. You'll see smaller plates, 12 inch in, and less in size. But most people don't do large plates. This particular piece, I think, is uh, 14 inches. The first big black plate we saw was 17 inches. Structurally, they're a very difficult piece to, to uh, dry and get complete and to fire and get out of fire. Next, please. This always reminded me of a French horn. And uh, I think I had somebody mention that it reminded them of a cornucopia. But I just wanted something that sort of flowed and gave you the feeling of, of going into the distance. So that's how this particular uh, design came about. My wife calls this a caffeine plate. Because clearly I was either drinking a lot of coffee or drinking a lot of Cokes when I did all the little detail work without thoughts of later on how much work that's going to need to carve, burnish, and clean up. And I, took it, I think it took me three 10 hour days to clean all the carving up on this one. And that's the end of my presentation.
of a pain condition called sedative. And I use that several times a day. When I'm making, uh, the outer parts of my hands will literally, literally, literally crack and bleed and hurt. So when I shower at night, the last first thing I do, or the last thing I do before I go to bed, is I move myself up. It looks, it literally, it looks like I stuck my hands in a thing of Crisco. Old, old people would know what Crisco is. <laughs> Older people. What about wearing knives or gloves when you do this? No. No. It, the, the, the clay is so abrasive that it just tear up any bone that you put on. So now, again, like I said, everything starts as a pinch pot. successful working with a wheel when I taught at universities 
and I tell the students, oh, I can work with it. Oh, come on, I'm trying. We'll show you. Clay goes shooting out that way, and you that way. You guys are just doing this to frustrate me. Okay, so now we have a piece started. And the next thing we're going to do is the coil on I can do this in the camera too. I had to learn because my right arm is so tired. fast and it starts to get oblong and not real not truly round. <laughs> Using the board lets me hit it very uniform in thickness and control. How long it goes and then flatten it down. And for when I'm making larger pieces, because I'm making longer coils, I use board about this wide. The only problem is if the coils are too loose, then you pick one up and it'll, it'll just break. You can't get them far enough up on your pots before you lose them. Now if I'm going to build my pieces out, I pinch the outer edge in and that leaves a base for the coil to be laid on. So if I'm going to come out, this is what I do. If I'm going to come in, say I bring a bowl up here or a piece up here, I'm going to start to curve it in. Then I pinch the inside out and that lays the coil on the inside. So as you're building it, you just sort of step it in and shape it. Pinch off the X's. Do this long enough, you're not even looking, you're just you're feeling your way around the pot. I watch Grandma work and she closed her eyes, and I always wonder, is her eyes bothering her? Is she tired? And then I realize what she's doing. She's literally feeling her way around the pot. Do this, please do, but maybe we can tighten the circle in because we're going to turn the rest of the lights on and let the massive cords flow in. So there's room over here, but I would ask you to please be conscious of the ceramic. Yeah. Um, Not get too close to it. Yeah. But you know, come around. The, I, I think Nathan isn't shy. He's happy to have you closer. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'm not too close So, um,
This is actually a my old driver's license, but I use old credit cards. I use, uh, you know, they don't give keys. It tells you that's all key cards. I use those. Um, AOL first came out. This came out. They used to send us the DVDs. I cut and shaped those. I just rape all the paper and stuff off of them.